Continue. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody, and massive welcome. Hold on, let me just get this water. A, a huge welcome to all our friends and colleagues who joined us today from here in the room at Lancaster University, and some of us here. And also, we have many colleagues who joined us around the world. And we're here today to celebrate the fantastic career of Margaret Hogg, who's our colleague who's here. I don't know if people can see her, but you'll get, you'll get to hear plenty of Margaret today. Um, I'm Maria Piacentini, and I know most of the people here, but this is available from me. And myself and Sandra Alvanis and Sheila, we are the people who have been organising this <laughs> and have been emailing you incessantly about this. So welcome to this event. Um, Let me just test if this works, it does. So um, just to give you a quick outline of our session and just to tell you what we're doing. So Margaret joined Lancaster University in 2004. And when Margaret came, my anecdote with Margaret is, <laughs> when she came for her interview, she stood up and said, I'm going to make Lancaster the number one place for consumer behaviour research, that people will come here. And I think we've definitely, <laughs> we're definitely there. We're a strong unit. And the people who've come here to give testimony, Margaret, to you, and everything you've done. So I think we can say you achieved that. So okay. thank you, that's wonderful. Um, this image here is Camille Pizarro's image of the conversation. And the reason I've put that picture up is because for those of us who know Margaret, know that she draws very heavily in her story and background. So she comes from a history background and storytelling and narratives are always featured in the conversation. And Margaret always said, what's the conversation you're joining? That was always a thing. We talk about papers. What's the conversation? You must know the conversation. So our conversation today, our co we're here today, we're going to talk about Margaret. We're going to talk about her contribution to the field, talk about identity and self, negative self, all those areas. And we're going to hear from people all over the place. We've got Anuja Pradahan, who is one of Margaret's PhD students, who's going to be speaking to us. We have Elfrida Penz from Vine, Management School is going to be joining us, who's worked closely with Margaret. And we have Pauline McLaren, who's at Royal Holloway, who's also been a great friend and colleague of Margaret's over the years. And in between times, we'll hear from some other people who have been important parts of Margaret's life. And I just want to say as well, before we get started, I want to especially welcome Margaret's family members who are here today. I know Margaret's sister, Francis, you're here. And I think Margaret's sons are joining us as well, aren't they? And Carol might be there somewhere. And Carol might be there as well. So hello to Margaret's family. It's lovely to see you here too. And we are recording this event, and that recording will be made available afterwards, so you don't need to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so without further ado, I'm going to now pass on to, we're going to hear from some of <coughs> Margaret's friends. Oh this my is. goodness. Oh, oh, no, right, that doesn't work. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> well, I have to go to my screen. Hey there, Margaret. Your colleagues tell me that you are retiring. Uh, it's hard to believe because you're so young. But you must be young because I know I am. This is a momentous occasion and certainly the culmination of a very distinguished and, and wonderful career. And, and I'm so excited for you as you begin the next chapter of your life. Your work has been very influential to me, especially early on when we were both starting to write about identity and avoidance selves and all of the things that go along with that. I think that you and I were both maybe members of that young Turk generation that I'd like to think helped to change some of the ways that we think about the study of consumer behavior. I know one contribution that certainly has done that, and that is the textbook that you and I, uh, along with our colleagues, uh, the late Gary Bonosi and Soren Askegaard, uh, have been writing for many years, uh, actually since the last century. Do you know that? Our, our first edition <laughs> came out in 1999, <laughs> and we're already up to the seventh edition today. I have so enjoyed working with you. 
you have been the conscience of the book. You are rigorous, uh, demanding, thorough, but also really a lot of fun to work with and someone that I always know that I can trust uh, to bring the right thing to the book. For that, and also just for being a great colleague and friend over the years, I wish you the best as you contemplate the next edition <laughs> of your adventure. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Chimmy Lee. I'm a lecturer at Lancaster University Medical School. I met Margaret during my second year PhD, and I managed to convince her to become my supervisor at the time. I still vividly remember it was my early second year PhD, and I met her at a cafe. She was so nice. I prepared lots and lots to try to convince her to become my supervisor. She was convinced, and she gave me her personal contact number straight away. Throughout the process, she was so incredibly supportive and kind. She always offered me constructive comments and feedback, maybe weeks, if not sooner. Without her, I wouldn't have been able to finish my PhD to a good standard. And later, I learned that she actually has never received any workload for my PhD, or supervised my PhD. And I was really shocked because she persisted and help me throughout, but that made me feel big all the time. So thank you so much, Margaret, for everything that you have done. I am eternally grateful. Thank you. We just know that you have touched so many people's hearts and helped with so many people's careers throughout the years. We love you, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Margaret, this is for you on the eve of your retirement. Um, I'm starting off properly, like you with an ACR conference, with a PowerPoint. And I'm calling this a narrative of how the camaraderie of research helped me find an authentic research self. Now I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoints and just tell you what I think. Um, Margaret, I've known you for a quarter of a century. You had a great deal of influence on my research self from our very first email exchanges when I was still a PhD student to a long standing exchange of ideas and friendship that spans several places and now a couple of decades. We met in person in 1999 at an ACR conference where else, where you were probably the only person from the UK in the room, and I was probably the only Australian in the room. Since then, we met at least once a year in places as varied as Atlanta, Austin, Basewater, Boston, Columbus, Collindale, you remember that, Egham, Edinburgh, Houston, Milan, Sydney, Manchester, Lancaster, Oxford, Liverpool, Newcastle. I think we're still working our way around the globe. Um, we've spent many hours in the British Library in the Fisher Library in Sydney, and many more Harry T and Cakes and cafes every day. Uh, we walked the gardens of Oxford, Windsor, Cheshire, um, and Sydney, wandered the art galleries of London, Liverpool, Sydney, flipped through decades of good housekeeping and seven decades of the Australian Women's Weekly, examining women's nerves in the 1950s to the Nell women in the 1980s to the knowing woman in 2019, from the electric servants of the 1940s to the robo vacuum of the 2020s, we looked through all of them in the name of consumer research and what fun we had doing that. But apart from that, I just want to say and acknowledge your considered, helpful, gentle, but firm questioning, the prodding and persuasion that has shaped my own research personnel over these decades. I can hear you say now, we've got to stop tapping around and get to it, Louisa. Your discipline, work ethic, always changed my more eclectic reading style. Your insistence on questioning every finding, um, trying to over my tendency to rush conclusions. Your patience and persistence has always made every paper better, every revision easier, 
and every review almost bearable. Even co-editing, especially show EJM, was made more manageable because you were doing it with me. Um, I can surely say that you have shaped my research self in many, many ways. And in particular, I want to focus in on this camaraderie of research, which you do so naturally. Um, you just take us along with you for um, on the research journey and make it so natural. This is a collaborative style that I think we don't meet very often anymore. Um, and working with you has made things so much more easy for me. So to the camaraderie of research, I say, um, that is a, such an important thing to be celebrated. And in you, uh, I would love to acknowledge that and uh, pay my respects to that because it is such an important gift to the community. Um, beyond my research identity, I just want to say your personal generosity and affection always touched me and our friendship has always been a treasure, pleasure. I have missed that pleasure very much in the last two years and we've not been able to walk together in gardens or debate about how that they got. Your friendship has shaped my personal self as well as my research self. I remember February 2020. The pandemic had just reached Sydney shows, and uh, you had been visiting and seeing you all that morning really brought home the seriousness of that whole period um, and the seriousness of what was to come. But having said that, um, here we are on the other side, I, and I really look forward to many more walks and gardens, debates on everything, and thank you for hearing songs in all those cities that we haven't yet been to and we know we will visit. Um, and I know though retirement means more time to spend uh, with your beloved grandchildren uh, and to take the train down to London to visit all those art galleries. Uh, I know you won't be relaxing. I know the research will go on and I'm looking forward to meeting up in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere in a library or a garden very, very soon. So here's to you, Margaret Hall, for everything you've done and for the camaraderie of research you've given me. Thank you. Okay, well, <laughs> we're now going to move on to um, an Anuja, Dr. Anuja Kazan. Anuja, are you there? Um, Anuja is going to Anuja was one of Margaret's PhD students and we asked her to speak to sort of represent that part of Margaret's career in life. So Anuja, I'm going to hand over to you. Are you there okay? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, and we can see you. Oh, fantastic. Hi, Margaret. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just waiting for my slides to load. Oh, sorry, that's me. <laughs> That's yes. my job. That's yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> there we go. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to be on time, so I'll time myself here. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Anuja Pradhan and I am an assistant professor at the University of Southern Denmark. And uh, Margaret is my PhD supervisor. And I say is because I still introduce uh, people um, to Margaret as my PhD supervisor, because I feel like if you know me, you know that I'm better off with supervision at all points than without, you know, so still my PhD supervisor. Yes, um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, Maria, Sandra and Schilling very kindly gave me this opportunity to speak today and they said that we would like you to talk about identity, self and consumption and how the conversations have evolved. Um, and much like my PhD, the link to consumption is going to be very tenuous at best, you know, but we'll, we'll pretend that it's there. Um, and I would like to talk about myths. So Maria spoke to you about stories and how Margaret has been really interested in stories. Um, and together with Margaret, what I've been interested in are um, stories that aren't true, because they're more fun, 
always, I think, than stories that are true. So myths are kind of those stories, right? So myths essentially um, represent some sort of naturalization of what is historically constituted. Um, and by that, what I mean is that they appear to be real, but they're, they're generally not. And um, we know that consumers can use myths to resolve certain identity tensions. Um, but we also know that myths can be ascribed to people. They're not necessarily something that we choose for ourselves. Um, and together, Margaret Haley and I have been looking into how do consumers with, within a group navigate identity myths in different ways across generations. Um, and that's where we kind of leave the consumption part now. <laughs> um, what I would like to talk about next, Maria, if you would uh, go to the next slide, is um, a few particular myths. Well, actually one particular myth, but let's say we're talking about the PhD journey. Um, and I think that the hero's journey really is a myth that applies to the PhD journey. And yes, I have cast all PhD students as heroes in this, and I think that's okay. Um, and we generally associate uh, the student with the apprentice myth and the supervisor with the mentor myth, right? Um, next slide, please. And generally, um, this mentor is a Gandalf-like figure, you know? So we're thinking Gandalf, we're thinking Dumbledore, we're thinking uh, Mr. Miyagi. So some um, old dude with a beard is generally what we think of. Um, and, you know, they're very much concerned with passing on the torch, right? They help the apprentice on this journey um, because they're the mentor. That's what they do. They appear to be some sort of an authority figure. Uh, they usually care about uh, the apprentice as many supervisors care about their PhD students, but they're also a bit aloof, right? Um, because that's how you gain more authority by not showing too much emotion. Um, they tend to disappear at some point. And I think, unfortunately, many PhD students will find this to be a true representation of their journeys with their mentors. Um, I can say that I did not find this to be true at all. Um, but they disappear because that's how the hero gets ahead. Right? That's how you overcome a crisis or an obstacle. You're on your own. Um, and they usually reappear at the end um, once uh, the evil monster has been slayed. Um, and here, the evil monster is the, the, are the people People on your PhD defense team, essentially, right? Um, but that's that's generally how we think of the myth. But in my experience, there is a different myth, perhaps that has been more relevant um, to my interaction with Margaret. And uh, next slide, please, Maria. And that is of the wisdom. Um, and I chose this super awkward photo, Margaret, where we both look like we don't want to be there, because um, apparently that's the only photo we have together. So we'll have to change that uh, when we meet over the summer, of course. Um, but so the wisdom is um, an archetype or a myth uh, from one of my favorite authors, uh, Robert Jordan, and his stories, uh, The Wheel of Time. Um, the books are problematic in many ways, but we'll leave that aside for today and we'll take what's good out of them, right? Um, so the wisdom, unlike the Gandalf figure, is not necessarily concerned with passing down the torch, but more with helping the apprentice light their own torch. And I felt that that was really true of my interactions with Margaret. Um, she encouraged me to find my own passions um, within academia. Right? She was more interested in me trying to find my own consumption related puzzles to solve, my own questions, my own um, methods in which to do it, rather than getting me to do things in the way that she did them, because she believed that that in the long run would be more helpful to me and perhaps to all of her students than others. Um, Margaret is extremely inspiring. And I think we can all agree on that. Um, she's been extremely inspiring, but she's never been aloof. Margaret, in my experience, has never shied away from showing emotion. She knows that you don't have to hide emotions in order to um, have some sort of authority. I have been inspired by Margaret since the first time that I saw her name, which was um, on this textbook 
the one that Michael Solomon showed us. Um, I was really inspired because she's the only female author on this team. Um, and this is the textbook that I had for my master's education. Um, and then I looked up her name and her work it just really resonated with me and um, I am glad that I chose to pursue her relentlessly until she agreed to be my PhD supervisor <laughs> from then. Um, but she's not just inspiring as an academic, she's also inspiring as a colleague, I think. Um, so I still remember the first time that I was away at a conference and I had gone to the US and I was at CCT um, and Margaret wasn't there. Um, so I remember I was standing near my poster and this professor comes up to me and it was um, the late Gary Bamosi, one of Margaret's close colleagues and friends. Um, and he comes up to me and he introduces himself and he says that, um, I see that Margaret's name is on your poster. And I was like, yes, she's my uh, PhD supervisor. And he goes like, oh yes, hi, I'm Gary Bamosi. And I was like, oh yes, I know who you are. And I was very excited because like, oh great, Gary Bamosi is gonna give me feedback on my research. Um, and then he goes, I have no comments on your research for you. <laughs> However, I just want to say, can you please pass on uh, to Margaret that I am thinking about her? You know, he came up to me to say that. Um, and I think that is really symbolic of how much Margaret's colleagues care about her because um, we are all linked in a way through Margaret. And um, I will try not to take offense at the fact that uh, Professor Pomosi had nothing to say about my research, but I appreciate <laughs> that he came up <laughs> to just uh, pass on his greetings to Margaret. So. So she's inspiring as a colleague as well. Um, the wisdom, like Margaret, has authority, but she understands that authority comes with responsibility. And Margaret never disappeared on the PhD journey. In fact, I disappeared. Um, I went away to where I am now, um, uh, Denmark, as a visiting PhD student for a couple of months. Um, and Margaret pretty much virtually followed me here. <laughs> We would talk every two to three weeks. She would check in on me. Um, I, because I'm a, I am a masochist, decided to come to Scandinavia in the winter time where I didn't know anybody. Um, and I think I had too much of an ego to say that I was finding it difficult, but I didn't need to say it. Margaret just knew and she would always check in on me and make it seem as though she was the one who wanted the interaction rather than um, the fact that I needed it, perhaps. so. She never disappeared at all. Um, Margaret was always emphasizing care and community over individual heroic journeys. I think with her and Haley, we really were a little family working on a project together. She never made me feel like I was in this alone. Um, it wasn't about being heroic. It was about trying to help each other and get things done. Um, she never made me feel like I was walking behind her. She always made me feel like I was walking with her. And I think that is something that I would like to carry on. And I hope that in my interactions with my students, I make them feel the same way because, um, I mean, you know, if you don't know Margaret, you, you may be intimidated by her and her prolific career and everything that she's done. Um, but as soon as I met her, the, the warmth that I got from Margaret, um, yeah, it just made me feel incredible. And it always still does. Um, and I know that Margaret always has my back, much like wisdom always has your back. And um, to know that you are always supported, I think is one of the greatest privileges as an academic, um, just as a person as well. And I am very glad that I've had that privilege. It has been an honor to have that privilege, and I know that I still have it with Margaret. And um, thank you, Margaret, for that and for so much more. I think that you are creating, through your supervision, a little community of future wisdoms um, and really just changing academia for the better through that. So thank you very much to you, and thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you. Mark, did you want to say anything? Well, I, I, I'm not going to reduce the two again, but I'm, I'm getting there. Thank you very much, Anuja. As you know, you have a very special place in my heart, and I can't wait to see you in July. Thank you. Thank you. Oh,
And there's, there's a new just thank you. So, returning, returning to the videos, let's see who we've got now sending messages to Margaret. All right, great. Let's throw a break. <laughs> I'm so pleased to have the chance to say a few words to help celebrate Margaret's career. As a scholar, Margaret is someone who I have long looked up to with immense respect. She's done really pathbreaking work on the topic of consumer identity. In particular, she's drawn attention to those identities that haunt us, our undesired selves, in contrast to work that simply highlights identities that we as consumers aspire toward. She's helped understand the emotions that consumers experience in regard to these undesired selves and to better appreciate the consumption choices that people make and avoid as a result. Beyond her work focused on identity, Margaret also has a vibrant stream of thoughtful research on gender and consumption, which has been fortunate for me because it's meant that we've crossed paths often. She's done really wonderful work on topics that affect the lives of so many women. For example, she shed light on how advertising affects young women's self-images. She studied how gender intersects with the consumption of technology, and she's eliminated the highly gendered <laughs> But more significant, perhaps, than any particular study Margaret has published is the example that she set to those of us fortunate enough to know her. She has lived her feminism, demonstrating what a principled scholar can do, and she has mentored many young women helping them establish their own path in this field. On a peer-to-peer -peer level, she's been a warm and caring colleague. With her calm demeanor, her wit, her humor, and her inherent kindness, Margaret has been one of the people who makes academia a better place. Margaret, I feel privileged to have known you. I wish you all the best in retirement, and I hope to see you again soon. Dear Margaret, five editions and almost 20 years with you on board. Tens of thousands of copies sold. I'm of course speaking of our mutual baby, the book, Consumer Behavior, a European Perspective. Not only has it been a success as a textbook, but it has also drawn more than 5,000 citations. Our colleagues use our book as a scholarly, scholarly reference, something which is no small accomplishment. Finally, I think that we can take pride in the fact that for more than two decades and for a huge number of business students, this book has been the first initiation to a social culturally informed approach to consumption and markets. Also no small accomplishment in times where business as usual is part of the problem rather than the solution. I know that I speak also for our dear departed friend and co-author Gary when I say that it was great taking this ride with you. From the bottom of my heart, thanks. Hey, Margaret, I just wanted to say congratulations on your excellent, excellent career, your inspiration to, to me and many others, uh, your years of service, uh, your hospitality to me when I visited Lums for a time, uh, your care of uh, Sheen and uh, Sky. Um, and others that uh, have been your students. Uh, I'll let them speak for themselves, but your doctoral students are a great legacy. And uh, you're, of course, your children, and uh, they will have children that will be your grandchildren, and they will carry on your, your legacy. Uh, I don't mean to lay it all on them because your research and your uh, research in particular on sense of self, sense of self, and objects, many related uh, topics have uh, been near and dear to my heart. And so I thank you for all of your contributions in that area. And most of all, congratulations and uh, thank you for being you. You've been a wonderful person to me and many others uh, over the years. Uh, I'm hoping that your retirement this time uh, is not gonna stop you from doing the wonderful things that you're doing. But just to say that you have had a marvelous career up to this point, and I don't think it's over by any means. So it's been wonderful to know you and uh, have you been a part of my scholarly life uh, and my personal life for that matter. So great to see you. Um, I'll sign off there and uh, see you, um, to see you in uh, conferences and such as we go along.
I have to get permission to be here. Hi, Margaret. It's Stephanie from Edinburgh here. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to celebrate with you today and to say how great it's been to work with you, to spend time with you and to learn from you over the years. I've been trying to think of when we first met, but actually I'm not able to remember that. It feels as though you've been a fellow traveller and an inspiration throughout my career. It's been a real joy to work with you on projects such as motherhood markets and consumption, and more recently, grandparent-grandchild relationships. I've loved watching you present and to share your insights at various conferences and workshops. And I've really enjoyed and learned a lot from reading your work over the years and how you've structured and crafted arguments in those papers. It's also been a real honor to watch you as an external examiner. With some of my PhD students, I've had that opportunity to see how kind and thoughtful and rigorous you are in the conversations that you've had with them. And from the other side, as an external examiner, I've seen the support and the inspiration that you've provided to your own students. I'm really going to miss you as a colleague in the years ahead, but I'm really hoping that that will be compensated for by many visits to Edinburgh when we'll be able to catch up. I hope the next phase in your life is full of many, many pleasures and joys, and I can't think of anybody who deserves it more. Oh, Thank you to those colleagues. Oh, I think I'm back. Okay, thank you. Oh, it feels quite emotional, doesn't it? <laughs> and we've got a refrain here. Kindness, care, support, loving. So I think, you know, these are what you've made the impression to these people, Margaret. We're now going to pass to Dr. Alfreda Pence. Alfreda, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, and you can see Alfreda. Hello. Hello. It's going to now I'm going to pass over to you to introduce yourself and to share your presentation. So I'll just here we are. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, Maria. Good afternoon and warm greetings from Vienna. Dear Maria, organizing team, ladies and gentlemen, dear Margaret, thank you for inviting me to this symposium to celebrate your Margaret's career. I have done Margaret Hawk now for more than 17 years. Even if we did not meet in person very often, our research kept us in contact. Besides, I may say that we have common interests in arts and culture. Let me briefly reflect on today's topics. These are the self, identity, and consumption. I have changed the order slightly and probably will disappoint those who expect a decent research talk. Instead, I would like to take you to the museum and invite you to join me on this journey. Next slide, please. Meet Tizian. Tiziano Vecellio was an Italian painter during the Renaissance. He was considered the most important member of the 16th century Venetian school. Recognized as the sun amidst small stars, Tizian was one of the most versatile of Italian painters. His work included portraits, landscape backgrounds, and methodological and religious subjects. His painting methods, particularly in the application and use of color, had a profound impact on painters of the late Italian Renaissance and on future generations of Western art. His work will bring a little color into my talk and with any luck provide you pleasure. The self-portrait of Titian, as you can see here, at the age of around 58, leads me to the self. Next slide, please. The self is studied as an intrapsychic phenomenon, as well as with respect to the multiple aspects of an individual, such as material, social, spiritual self. We live in societies in which the drive for self-esteem is essential for conceptualizing oneself and one's group identity. The painting called Vanitas portrays an idealized, beautiful woman. She holds an oval mirror with a frame which reflects some jewels and a maid who is searching in a case. She certainly looks after herself and in some way she encourages us to look into the mirror. Perhaps you ask yourself, how have I become the researcher, the person who I am today? 
or when was the first time I wanted to become a researcher? Lucky are those who can remember and those who could quickly identify the moment in which it became crystal clear. However, others, including myself, cannot remember that moment. We were not planning a clear path and therefore rather developed into the person we are now. This came with many uncertainties and challenges and often meant taking two steps back and one step forward. I can remember though that few people had a distinctive impact on the timing and direction of my career. Next slide, please. So who were the influencers on my journey? The teacher-student relationship can be best illustrated with Titian's two images, which are assumed to belong to the same painting. First, I would like to mention the supervisor of my diploma and doctoral thesis, who mainly argued that no one should choose academia. This has encouraged me to choose the academic path. However, not without applying for the industrial sector, luckily this was not to be. I learned my lesson never follow the advice of others. The supervisor became a valuable co-author in many research projects since then. Another significant influencer was a friend and colleague whose job became available when he spent a semester abroad. I took over his job during his absence at the Institute and I'm still working there. This is notable because my background was in psychology and the Institute is international marketing management. It meant having to start from scratch and to figure out how a psychologist can survive in the field of marketing. So what happened to my colleague? He returned from his sabbatical, but a few months later, he was hired by UMIS, now the University of Manchester, and still lives and works in the UK. He's another important influencer because besides joint research and conference visits, he initiated the contact to Margaret. When I decided where to go on my sabbatical, I consulted him and discussed several options. He then mentioned Margaret's name, as he, as she, before joining Lancaster University, worked at Manchester. And he must have sensed that my letter requesting being hosted at Lancaster University would be approved. So I spent about eight months at the University of Lancaster and got to know Margaret and the team at the Department of Marketing. As part of, of my research stay, I met with Margaret regularly and we developed a joint research project. Working together with Margaret and being able to spend time away from my home university increased my self-awareness as a researcher and helped me to gain confidence in what I do. This eventually led to my habilitation, Venia Docenti at VU, a milestone in my career. My mental representation of who I am was nurtured by these important ties and interactions and ongoing relationships. Without them, I would not be here today. Next slide, please. Now meet Lavinia, girl with a basket of fruits, a painting by Dizian, that depicts a young woman holding aloft the platter which is heaped with fruit. The girl wearing a dress that is made from an ex expensive copper colored fabric that catches the light, has her back turned to the viewer and shows her face by looking over her shoulder. The shallow bowl that contains the fruit, fashioned from a metallic material such as pewter, and decorated with a pattern of interlocking curves is held up to the level of the girl's forehead by both of her hands. Let me turn with this image now to my research on consumption with Margaret. There is one article that we published in the European Journal of Marketing. It reached an impressive number of 238 citations and 17,264 downloads. The most recent citation is about a week ago and is in a publication in the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science. The title of the publication is The Role of Mixed Emotions in Consumer Behavior. And we uh, 
investigated ambivalence. So what is the research all about? We try to understand approach avoidance conflicts experienced by shoppers in online stores versus brick and mortar stores. We found out that consumers felt more ambivalent and more ambivalent in the physical store, even if they joined it, enjoyed it more than the online store. So we also identified mediating effect the consumers' intention to purchase stores, which make consumers feel they should come back and explore the store further, make them enjoy the store more, which leads to purchase intentions. Why? Complex and novel environments are responsible for these feelings. So there is no difference found also between online and offline stores. The topic, the research topic was presented internationally, for instance, conferences in Athens, Sydney, Reykjavik, Milan, and San Francisco. In addition to this important research project, we work together on a book chapter in the seminal Routledge Companion to Digital Consumption, edited by Russell Belk and Rosa Lamas, um, consumer decision-making in online and offline environments. The second edition of the book is about to be published soon. The article in the European Journal of Marketing is amongst my top five most cited papers. It is a publication that I'm very proud of because it not only reflects the collaborative and encouraging conversations I always enjoyed with Margaret, but it also reflects the international nature of our work. It always reminds me of our stimulating, encouraging and exciting conversations and Margaret's supportive way of developing research. This leads me to the third theme, identity. Next slide, please. Identity and consumption are linked in the expression of identity through symbolic objects. Identity explains human behavior, it influences emotions, perceptions, and behaviors, and affects relationships. Erickson says that identity is formed in infancy and developed throughout the life cycle along identifications and transactions with others. Now, Dizian's portrait of a woman and her daughter is a rare pairing in Venetian painting of the time. The identity is unknown, although some say that the two were part of Dizian's own family. The painting illustrates a possible outcome when the work is left unfinished. Following Dizian's death, the painting was altered by someone in the studio to depict Tobias and the Archangel Raphael, a transformation that diminished the quality of the work. Only in the second half of the 20th century was the underlying incomplete image of the mother and child revealed. Now, how does that translate to our identity? Sometimes we struggle to find our place in the universe of academia. My identity as a researcher has been very much shaped by the interactions and conversations that I had with significant people. My lessons or my lesson learned here, identity as a researcher may be incomplete, just as the image that was revealed in Dizian's painting. However, it develops throughout the life cycle of academia. It is shaped by influential people, how favorably ideas are adopted and how kindly people are treated. The impact Margaret had on me is certainly not a one-off case. Looking at the research output, her extensive collaborations, I can say that Margaret's research and contributions encourage and bring forth significant research and spark ideas. Next slide, please. I will therefore conclude with Dizian's wisdom again. This is a surreal painting showing a female as wisdom resting on a cloud with a written scroll over her body and looking into either a book or a mirror. The association with clouds would suggest thinking, the scroll a book would suggest reading, and if the book is a mirror, this would suggest wisdom can be found by looking.
The idea of wisdom is perfectly set in the correct place, an entrance to a reading room in a library. Titian uses wisdom resting and floating on clouds as a depiction to show that wisdom is a separate condition and is a thinking state. To me, it perfectly symbolizes the true nature of good academics. And Margaret happens to be one of those. Next slide, please. Titian created the Feast of Gods together with Ciambellino. What a marvelous image to me to show fellowship and celebrate Margaret's career. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you all for your attention and having me. Thank you. Thank you. I don't mind if it's just you moved to say anything. And thank you, Elfrida. And I just love the titians. It's just brilliant to see all that art sort of woven in so carefully. I really appreciated that. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, before I move on to the next segment of videos, I want Mr. Barno, I know you wanted to say something. Do you want to maybe take the floor for a minute? Yeah, happy to. Thank you, Maria. Uh, hi, everybody, uh, here and uh, at home. My name is uh, Stefano Pontoni, and I've been a part-time professor here at Lancaster University for almost 10 years now. And over the last 10 years, I've been appreciating very much the many conversations I've had together with Margaret, who share an interest on the topic of identity. And we come from a quite different methodological and theoretical background, but I've learned a ton from our conversations, and I've been something I really very much treasured every time that I was visiting uh, uh, Lancaster. But I actually got to know um, uh, Margaret much earlier than that. And I like to share an anecdote, like uh, a little bit of um, Was it not? And uh, um, I don't know which slide, uh, if I'm giving you my back. I think, oh, 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 oh. And uh, um, so I uh, uh, started my PhD at the uh, London Business School in the year 2000. And uh, I had luck to get uh, a, uh, my undergraduate thesis accepted to the European APR conference which was then held in Berlin in, uh, in 2001. I went to the conference. There was nobody from the department that I knew. I was completely alone there. I had to speak English at the time. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, with my first accent, you wouldn't guess it now. <laughs> I can tell you. I can tell you. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> good at all. And uh, I, uh, um, I had no idea what to expect from an academic conference. And having a bit of an idea that this was an important event and it was a bit formal, I showed up at EACR dressed in a suit and a tie. <laughs> and I was essentially the only one. I was only 24 at the time. <laughs> and I, was, uh, uh, I had shaved the head and four big golden earrings. So uh, <laughs> there was not a queue uh, around the corner to talk to me. At the <laughs> and I was probably looking quite creepy, actually. <laughs> Standing there in the corner, knowing now we're looking like completely uh, like some kind of an odd person. But I had the great luck to bump into Margaret. And uh, together with another uh, very sweet lady called Susan Oti, who was also yes. at the conference, uh, they were basically the very first people that I met in this field. And uh, uh, they played no small part in me forming this idea of this field being full of uh, generous and kind people and interesting and smart people. And for this, I'll be very grateful for everyone, Margaret, for just being there and as a very esteemed and uh, senior person in the field, talking to this loser, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not for two minutes, but for actually a long time. A lot of really nice conversations. And we met at conferences every year ever since. And it was actually a, a very nice element of also my happiness of taking this position here at Lancaster, knowing that I would have the opportunity to meet her even more regularly. I just want to conclude with an observation. In the literature and psychology about stereotypes, you uh, have one model that has been very um, influential in the past couple of decades, it's called the stereotype content model. And the model argues that there are really two dimensions to uh, stereotypes, and that these explain uh, our basic stereotypes towards groups of people and individuals in a large extent, and these are warmth and confidence. And those two stereotypes are often assumed to be inversely correlated. So if you take, for example, culture, Southern Europeans like me are supposed to be warm but incompetent, <laughs> while uh, Northern Europeans like you are supposed to be cold but competent. <laughs> and uh, uh, I am not uh, uh, very fond of stereotypes generally because I think in many situations they hold uh, people back, and I think especially women. 
And that's for that reason, I'm very glad to be able to report that in Margaret, we have one exemplar of a person who's clearly showing you that uh, you can be uh, warm and confident. <laughs> with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much for all our conversation. I'm looking forward to continuing uh, our parting tonight. Right. Thank you, Stefan. Stefano. That's a lovely compliment. Thank you. So let us now move on to some more contributions from around the world from people who wanted to talk to Margaret today. Hi, Margaret. Now, when I was thinking about putting together this video, at one point, I did think about using that picture of us all at St. Gala at the symposium organized by Tanya several years ago. But then I thought instead I'd take a wander up to the Brave Hills and use Edinburgh as a backdrop. Over the years, we've had the pleasure of working with you in a number of different things, from teaching through to appointments and sitting on panels, and then more recently, personally, working with you on the Leverhulme project, along with Tanya and Alan and Teresa. And I have to say that in that time, it's been an absolute pleasure, whether it's meeting in Edinburgh or presenting at conferences or a meeting in St. Gallen, it's been a pleasure to work with you on that research project. You always remind us of the importance of the historical perspective and bring wise words to many of the discussions and the debates we have. And of course, you were absolutely instrumental in putting together the EJM special issue. On the teaching side, of course, um, I still use your textbook, sorry, Maria, and it remains um, a very reliable stalwart in the consumer behavior course. I know that you work with a lot of PhD students and inspired people across academia. So I very much look forward to the rest of the symposium and hearing some more about that and some more of the contributions. I look forward to seeing you, I hope, fairly soon in Edinburgh. And who knows, we might even get another trip out to Sydney, perhaps sometime around January or February. So until then, have a great day. And I very much look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you. Bye. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a quite a moving moment for me as an important memorial society site is closing uh, along with Margaret's time. My first contact to Margaret was over a phone call almost 20 years ago with me, my nervous being in Thessaloniki and uh, Margaret in uh, Manchester. This call resulted in her being uh, my doctoral supervisor and ended up in a lifelong family friendship and collaboration in consumer research. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to work heavily thank Margaret for all the things that uh, she offered to me all these years. Uh, I admire her for being an inspiring academic and scientist, uh, but especially for her social skills and uh, ethos, uh, which together give her this lovely, balanced personality. She always fostered excellence, and I remember her as the person that uh, brought people together in the academic community. I'm really grateful for having a teacher and a colleague like Margaret. Margaret, thank you for all your support and love all these years. Enjoy your retirement and your extended family. Love I you. love you. <laughs> Margaret has been my doctoral supervisor for more than four years. She has supported not only me, but generations of doctoral students. She showed us how marketing research works, and she always underlined the importance of identity for consumer research. I remember Margaret once using the colloquial British phrase, sitting by Hedy, which means learning a job by observing how an experienced worker does it. Margaret, I am very grateful for having had the chance of sitting by you for a while. I wish you all the best for the future. Hello, Margaret. I'm so happy being with you today 
It's not easy to say that when we are actually not together when recording this clip. However, I must tell you, I'm so happy to be with you on this occasion. I can't help but thinking about the time when we first met, when I actually, a lot of the time when I first started my academic career at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, it's called UNIST, <coughs> and the brand name disappeared. But the nice memory working with you still all the time remains in my mind. And that was the reason, actually, I went to you for help to develop a paper with a quantitative research method. I'm so grateful to you, Margaret, that I've learned properly the qualitative research method under your direct advice and coaching. And we share the joy and the great fun developing this paper and eventually have it published in the Journal of Business Research. Well, with the COVID pandemic, we couldn't meet face to face together. So I hope before too long, we will still have the chance to meet over coffee, perhaps in Manchester. Finally, I'd like to extend my sincere and best wishes, all the best wishes for your happy, joyful retirement life. Again, lots of lovely moving comments from people. Our last speaker in the room, so to speak, not in the room, is Pauline. Pauline, are you there? I am. Uh, hello, can you see me and hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah we can. I'm just going to get your slides up for you. Okay. No, don't put my don't put my slide up yet, please, Maria. Okay. You tell me when. Over to you. Over to you, friend. <laughs> I don't want to ruin the impact. I only have one slide, so I just do a short introduction and then I'll ask you to put it up, okay? Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Hello everyone and a special hello to you Margaret. This is a, a great day for celebration. No more NSS scores and ref quota to make. You know you can just uh, uh, relax now and enjoy uh, hopefully some more research of course. And Maria, thank you so much for inviting me to join these celebrations of Margaret's career. I'm really delighted to speak about your academic contributions, Margaret, because, well, as we've already heard, in fact, uh, you know, from so many people, I think these have been really significant for all of us here today, and of course, way beyond the, the, the people that are, are present. Uh, for now, though, I'd like to speak about you from a, a UK perspective and, of course, as your personal friend as well, but talk about the wonderful contributions you've made to our academic community here. Aside from your considerable contributions uh, to knowledge, of course, which I'm going to come back to shortly, uh, and which we're all completely in admiration of, um, your wider contributions to community building, I think have just been absolutely immense. And uh, we've heard that again and again in the, uh, the talk so far. You just excel at relationship building. And for this reason, when I think of you, Margaret, I think of a builder. Uh, I see you as Margaret the builder. Now, you can tell I've been spending too much time with my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at that stage, uh, but I'm not just thinking of you as Bob the Builder with sort of muscles and in a construction job. What I'm thinking of is more in, in terms of developing the teams and the networks of scholars around you. And most importantly, sharing your knowledge and expertise within those communities to build them. Uh, that is what has been so strong, I think, about all of us who, who, who've known you about your profile. And you've built these communities communities in so many ways. So if I can have this slide now, Maria. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Margaret, it's my, my granny brain, I'm afraid, which I'm sure you'll appreciate. 
Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about your contributions at these different levels, which I, I think have all been so significant, the departmental level, the national level, and the international level, of course. So first of all, at the university departmental level, you've made major contributions to growing and building marketing groups at both Manchester and Lancaster universities. I remember when I first came into academia, your group at Manchester was just a hive of activity, running great seminars, mini conferences. You were always at the center of these and uh, I attended various ones and it, it just really filled me with inspiration uh, at that time. You've always surrounded yourself with su such capable and creative colleagues. And I think that's really down to your wonderful team building skills. And of course, we see it very much with the Lancaster team now too. Um, your doctoral students as well are, are legends, really. Um, I think you've supervised 15, maybe more. And of course, many have uh, a talk today and are, are here today. But you've been so dedicated to working with them. I've watched you with great admiration, uh, always uh, helping them build their international networks. And in general, you know, being uh, fundamental in their careers and 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 letting them fly uh, forward uh, you know, on their own. And so many have grown to be outstanding academics in their own right. So at the national level then, uh, Margaret, you're, you're one of the early pioneers of consumer behavior in the UK, without a doubt. And you just played a leading role in building our, our com consumer behavior community here. Particularly, I think, in establishing links with the US uh, academia, you know, through your constant presence there at the ACR conferences and through building really a really strong reputation and really strong networks there as well. And of course, hosting various scholars from the US. Uh, this has been so important to us, I think, and really um, helping us put ourselves on the map. And of course, you've, you've networked not just with the US, but internationally, as we see so clearly with uh, everybody that's, uh, the, that's here today. But that has really helped build our UK community, I think, and, and make it extend outwards and enhance our own reputations. So again, you're always giving back to us, I think, um, you know, from your learnings. And um, you've been, you know, so I see you as pivotal in gaining this recognition for our scholarship here in the in the UK. And I think the, the textbook that uh, Michael Solomon and Soren have already talked about at length, I think that really testifies to your uh, reputation because really you're the UK representative on that very famous textbook that is so widely used. Then finally, at the, at the international level, of course, you have built the most superb reputation that feeds back into all this community building. And the theme of this symposium is identity, self and consumption, how the conversations have evolved. And you've been absolutely at the center of these conversations and initiating them very much here in the UK. If I can go back a little bit, I guess it's quite a long way now to 1966, and, sorry, 1996. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm afraid if pushed, I could go even further back. <laughs> but, <laughs> definitely Freudian slip from a baby boomer. Yeah. So, your first paper, Margaret, in the Journal of Marketing Management on identity, self and consumption, a conceptual framework. This I really see as a seminal paper, you know, in terms of uh, us in the UK that challenged the traditional focus of so much consumer behavior of the time, focusing on just the positive aspects of the consumer decision-making stages. And you really took the conversation on, initiated this different way of looking at it, embracing the negative aspects as being so important and looking more at the macro aspects of identity construction and considering all these that move the conversations way past the decision-making 
um, stage and the fixation on that and the purchase decision, of course. And, and so this body has a really evolved through you and your doctoral students and the colleagues you've worked closely with, looking at from the negative self to all the other questions of identity and how consumption plays such a significant role in building and maintaining relationships, particularly familial ones. Uh, that have been so often previously taken for granted, I think. You've really shown the depth there of how consumption can bind people together. And the emphasis over the years, as we've seen, in fact, from the other talks, has become much more on identity projects and the social relations in which they're embedded. And so you've been pivotal to all that, I think, bringing so many insights to family life, intergenerational aspects, coupledom, siblings, uh, motherhood, of course. Uh, and of course, that's where I had the good fortune to work with you. We did a book together um, uh, with uh, Stephanie, who I think is here today as well, uh, and some others. And we worked on the Empty Nester Woman too together. And I still remember how we, how we thought that project up. We were at the ACR conference, sitting, chatting round, uh, round a table, just, you know, uh, general chit chat. And we both discovered that we had suddenly become empty nesters and our children had just gone off to university. So of course we were comparing notes about how sad we felt and how we were questioning ourselves as mothers and, and getting used to this new role. And our project was born. And we did a lot of great research on that, that you, know, you really led. Um, so this brings us, I think, neatly back from looking at the relationships between mothers and children um, that I had the good fortune to, to work with on you, brings us back to the relationship building that you're so good, you're good, so good at Margaret. And I think it's an appropriate place for me to shut up and let others talk now. Um, but I think you'll go on building in your retirement, you'll build new things, but I think you'll also not stop building research, but you'll just have a lot more time to devote to that and not all the um, awful sort of nitty gritty stuff, as I said, like the NSFs and the REF scores that we all have to become so occupied with. So I wish, wish you every good fortune in your new role as Emerita um, Professor at Lancaster and very much hope to be seeing you soon and uh, hoping to maybe plan some work on grannyhood. <laughs> so thank you very much to everyone. And I hope you enjoy these celebrations a lot, Margaret. Thank you, Colin, that's brilliant. Give a lot of lights. I love, it. I love Bob the Builder link. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> right, so, so we're, we're almost at the end. We're going to just have one more little set of videos. And then we're going to give the floor to Margaret, who's probably going to say a few words herself. So just, and this is um, this final group, Margaret, is mainly your PhD students. Oh, right. Okay. So we're going to hear from the people who've heard a lot of it. Today. What to say? Um, but thank you, Margaret. Thank you for the kind of considerable impact that you've had on me and on my career over the years. Going back to sort of meeting you first when you're teaching that consumer behaviour class um, on the MSc Marketing in the Manchester School of Management. And um, that was the sort of, for me, that's when I became infused about consumer behaviour and academic research. And then sort of coming back to do a PhD with you, um, your influence on me and impact on me over the years has been sort of tremendous, both in terms of kind of initially as a supervisor and then as a sort of mentor and collaborator, critical friend. And I've sort of seen that with many other people as well. So we all owe you um, so much. And also the field of consumer behaviour in terms of the sort of conversations that you've opened up around topics. So, you know, congratulations on such a fantastic career and managing to be such a nice person along with it. Thank you. <laughs> Margaret, you have been a great and supporting PhD supervisor, a wonderful and inspiring author, and always a dear friend. It has been a real joy to work with a lady so well read, 
so passionate, calm, and professional at the same time. Like so many others, I get a lot of inspiration from your work and from your creative ideas in our talks. Thank you for always being there to provide guidance whenever needed. I'm also grateful you have given several talks to our staff and master students here in Exeter in our seminar series. We all felt inspired by your talks. I truly appreciate everything you did for me over the years. I wish you best of luck and success in all of your future activities. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Phoebe Wong. Oh, I graduated in 2010. Just want to take this opportunity to express my deepest appreciation to Margaret. Thank you, Margaret, for your guidance and encouragement during my PhD journey and journal publications. You're always patient to make sure that I'm on the right track. Margaret has profound contributions to the field of consumer behavior. With her insight on self and consumption, we further develop Bell's extended self to the concept of extended possessions in the context of gift giving. I'm very blessed to have Margaret as my supervisor. Thank you, Margaret. Happy retirement. Oh, that's it. Yay. Um, um, my son, I still can't believe that you're retiring. Or that you saw it already have. But I just wanted to say a huge thank you for all of your time and support over the years and for being a wonderful PhD supervisor to me during my time at Lancaster. And I genuinely felt incredibly lucky to have you, the great Professor Margaret Hogg, as my <laughs> supervisor. And you were always full of support and wisdom. And I'm not sure if I ever told you this, but you became my academic mum. And you invested so much time into each of your supervisions even when faced with some quite challenging times. And I think that's the real marker of a great academic. Even after the PhD, you've remained an invaluable source of advice, part careers coach, part co-author, part friend, but definitely the oracle of all things academic. And not only do you leave behind an impressive legacy in terms of your academic publications and profile, but a legacy in terms of socialising the next generation of researchers who I'm sure will follow your example. So thank you for everything. Uh, enjoy your time. Please put your feet up and have a well-deserved rest. Oh, that's so lovely, wasn't it? Thank you. Thank you, PhD students. Um, so just, we've heard from lots of people about Margaret, and I think it's probably now time to give Margaret the floor. What to say? Um, <laughs> thank you, Margaret. Sorry, Emma. Catch you already. What I want to do now is just pass over to the great Professor Margaret Hall, who's going to just say a few words. Yes, yeah, just say a few words. Well, I'll we'll just say when I'll. Oh, right, okay, I'm at my side. Uh, so, well, I have to start with many, many, many thanks the achievement to bring all this together. I mean, how many hours have you spent on this, you mean, Sandra and Maria? That's just absolutely amazing. You're Thank welcome. you very much. You're very you. welcome. I did say, when we were having a planning meeting, I did say to Maria, now you're not going to make me cry, are you? <laughs> and she said, um, well, maybe uh, use the, um, don't use- what Waterproof, was, waterproof what mascara. Was well, I went one step further. Oh. In case there's any too much information, I didn't do my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would be the safest thing to do. I do have about three thousand words, but I'm probably not going to use them all. And you'll be pleased to know, because I'm going to do what I used to do for my students, to throw them out the wall, which is I would skip. But of course, because we've only got one slide, you'll be pleased to know, you won't know necessarily the bits that I have skipped. <laughs> Um, so do I have slides up? That's what, yes, I will have my slide up now. So I'm not going to be able to sort of shout out to everybody. I mean, obviously I would like to, but it's going to be tricky. But I do have to think, thank James Cronin for this. He used this in the, he gave Sir Sigmund Wine this 
as a paid for a paper for CCT, I think it was in um, Old Minster, which was derived originally from so called phony divine gastron, and I have borrowed it. And the reason I borrowed it is because I think it gives me a very nice structure, sort of in terms of what our themes are today, which is identity, self consumption, and this sense of the trajectory. So the emerging desire self, which is me at the end, which is me being grandma all the time. Mm -hmm. But if we start with the past self and then think about the transition, originally, when we had the macro context at the top, I thought, oh, I don't need those. Why do we want macro context? And really, uh, I think maybe for the international audience, what I'm going to talk about now actually doesn't actually make a lot of sense. But as a historian, as you've heard, I can't avoid my dates and I can't avoid the impact of the government decisions on education for my generation, which were absolutely tremendous, starting with the 1944 Butler Act. Now, this is the point which I do jump in and say, I, this was before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> so the one thing about the 1944 Butler Act was that it made secondary education free. And that made an enormous difference by the time I was coming into secondary education in the mid 60s. There are two or three other important points uh, that happened as well. In, 19, in uh, 1963, Robbins wrote a report that suggested we needed more provision at the higher education level. And being a historian, I went back and had a quick look, and they were saying, well, lots of these initiatives are already unsteady. But that said, Lancaster was one of the ones that was set up in 1963. And this is where I have to tell a tale against myself. I uh, had fallen in love with history, 12 years old, met Queen Elizabeth I and thought history is for me, I must do history. So my consumption story today is about education. So you've got education up here and you've got education down here. And what I wanted to do, obviously, was to study history. And I was very fortunate and got offered a place at Lancaster University, which I accepted. Ooh. And I was coming until I got the letter from the university that said there was no university accommodation on campus. And I would have to live in Morecambe with a landlady at a b and <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And I was living in Mortar at this point. Now, Mortar, as you know, is a pretty nice warm <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, which is also cold and windy it's also cold and windy but the great thing about edinburgh was again they put me in a beat to be and again there was no university accommodation left uh by the time i'd made up my mind and uh, but it was only a 20 minute walk <coughs> from toll cross through the meadows to george square so you know hands up so that was that so that's the other important bit, if we just skip back to the macro for a minute, I'm annoying you now because it's an extinct student. Uh, the macro for another minute is in 1992, John Majors uh, decided that one of the, his government decided that one of the things they would try and do is, is to raise the level and provision of higher education. And they created a lot of uh, universities from foreign polytechnics. Now, the reason that was important to me was because I really landed on my feet. Because I went, I did, I wanted to be a history teacher. So the first time my husband Richard went uh, for the job in, um, well, first of all, of course, I ended up working at KSU. So in terms of the past <laughs> self, we haven't even got to the academic self yet. So I worked for, uh, so I've skipped a bit, sorry. And I, 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 I mustn't skip this bit because Lancaster comes in again. So, so we went, so, if you think about Rust Belt and highways and byways, in terms of what I did, I had um, four years in Amsterdam when I was first married, more history. And when my husband came to Lancaster for his interview, I said to him, you know, do you just find out about the history course? Well, he comes back and he says, well, they say there's no demand for history teachers. Uh, you'd be much better off doing this Marbach course. Marbach. Well, Marvel was actually the forerunner of the MBA. 
But at that point, the, uh, the management school didn't exist as such. Lots of departments. It was Board D. It wasn't even uh, a county. And uh, Marble was the overall course. And that's where I met and fell in love with consumer behaviour. So that was great. And they weren't too different, really, because they were asking the same thing, which is why do people do the things they do? I mean, I think they asked the same questions, basically. And interesting enough, the historian training did work out really well for CB. So I said to Richard when he came back for that interview at Lancaster, you know, and I go, no, no, you do the Marvel course. So I did the Marvel course, and then I went to the and I was there for seven years. So we're getting to sort of here now, um, a turning point. And then, of course, um, uh, he had the chance to get a promotion at Manchester. We had a, a little baby then, Daniel. Uh, he was about 10 months old, I think, when he knew it. He hadn't had Robert at that point. But I said to him again at some point in the 80s, he's definitely the 80s now, I remember I wasn't born in that time. <laughs> I'll just mention that again in case that's stuck. Um, asked about these history teacher courses. Well, he came back again, and what was, I was lucky really, because obviously in those days people still met parties across disciplines and across faculties. And he'd made quite a good friend of a pr pr professor of education. And the advice this time was well, you could teach history. But really, you've got the marble, you've got the cashews, you're a woman. You'd be much better off doing it yourself. So, all right, so I went off to Bolton, did a PGCE, so I could teach 16 plus. And then I really fell on my feet, which is why we come back to 1992, because Salford College of Technology did deliver some university education. It was really keen to improve its profile. So, when I said, oh, well, I've actually got a friend that do you think you might sponsor me? Yes. I mean, I was teaching 21 hours a week, and I was given three weeks, three hours off my work. So you can imagine, <laughs> I only made a bit of a difference. So the people I made the real sacrifice, of course, were the family. Uh, but they were very good, and they put up with it. Richard already had his, and of course, Daniel and Robert were still some way away from getting to their respective education careers. So I went uh, to Salford to College of Technology. I was there about ooh, eight, nine years. I had a great time there, uh, which is what I want to emphasize throughout my career. So I had a great time. I mean, not quite a penny farm to life, so I really couldn't spend it. <laughs> <laughs> but, the best, but most of the time, most of the time, I have had an absolutely great career. So I met some great people, learned tons about teaching and teaching techniques and management. And because they funded me for my PhD, that gave me the way to get to UMIS. And UMIS was a wonderful place, absolutely wonderful. Very male, but very supportive. Because obviously, basically, with science and technology, and if you think about that generation, who would have been to large enough before? They would all have been to a large extent men, but they were very supportive. I sat on committees with them and I learned so much. They were wonderful. And the person, the other person I want to mention from there is this idea of mentoring, which I, I wouldn't want to claim I invented all by myself because there was a wonderful woman, from the time now, Barbara Lewis, who you won't have come across necessarily because she's into services marketing, you know, so you won't have come across her name to do the hair. So when I went and I, I put my application in, my supervisor rang one of the profs at um, Emerson uh, and said, oh, don't throw her application in the bin, you know, do give her a chance. So they invited me along and there were two panels. And the reason there were two panels is that <laughs> was because the profs basically didn't get on. I mean, what's new? <laughs> so, uh, so there were two panels and got halfway through and I need to go to the loop. So Barbara's really good. She says, I'll take you. So she takes you to the room. You get to the door, go inside. And she says, you do know this is for real. No, this is, this is the real thing. Basically, you won't put foot forward unless you do, you know, do it really well now. It's do or die, basically. So I owe Barbara that because, of course, she put me on the right track. And she kept me on the right track. She was an amazing mentor. Very, very generous. And if I modeled myself on anybody, it would have been. Online. So that was Eunice, and then <coughs> in 2004, um, I got the opportunity, well in fact I, got, I think I got the appointment in December 2003, I got the opportunity to come back to Lancaster, 
And I've been here ever since and had 17 wonderful years. And I have really enjoyed myself. And I want to thank everybody for having given me a great time. <laughs> okay, well, I think, I think I've think i got to there. And as I say, merging to side self, that's me and Kyle. And is that one of your grandchildren on there? Um, that's yes. not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I mean, I've had some other stories, but I think I, it's all, it all fitted together. It all fitted together. Well, That's right. Oh, well, the only thing I wanted, two things I wanted to say. Sorry, privilege, privilege, okay. privilege, privilege. Just make sure you stay near the mic. So you can hear this. <laughs> important point coming up. Important, <laughs> two important points coming up. Privilege. Um, of course, the great thing about being part of the baby boomer genera generation was that our education, we got means tested grants. I got £90 a term, which was a massive amount of money there, and you didn't have to pay it back. And you didn't have any of these student fees. The local government paid something, but you didn't have that. So a mm. incredibly privileged. But the other thing I think is, is a privilege is that the opportunities that Salford and Eunice and Lancaster all offered me, uh, which has made such a difference to my life. So thank you very much, everybody. Now thank I'll you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody in the audience that yeah. has joined us from all over the place. Um, from all the contributions we've had, all the speakers, all the audience who stayed with us. We've had a really large audience today as well, which is amazing. Before we finish, we do have Beth, we do have just a small gift to give you, Margaret, to Mark. And we're going to go out for dinner, but we just want to say a really big thank you. And all those emotions that came through today are really strong, very heartfelt. There's a lot of tears in the room, I think, here as well, recognizing what they've done. So, Margaret, I just want to give you a really big round of applause, big hug from everybody. So to our audience, to everybody who's digitally joined us digitally, thank you so much. And we will share the recording after so people can watch it on time. So thank you. Thank you, all our speakers. Thank you to everybody here today. And Sandra and Sheiling. Sheiling's on maternity leave, so this is a tremendous effort from her. Sandra's got COVID. So, <laughs> but we all got here today. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank bye. You, bye. Bye. And bye. All the best. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good time tonight, Margaret. Bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye, 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 Mom. Bye, Mom. Bye, James. Bye, James. Is Lampros Sandra? Lampros. <laughs> People don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> David and so. Bye, Margaret. Bye, Margaret. <laughs> Bye, Margaret. Bye, Margaret. Okay. Hope you feel better soon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>